I know that we've put Matthew on hold here, and uh, I'm looking forward to returning to the Sermon on the Mount, as I hope that you are as well. But I also count it a, singular, a singularly kind providence that for the first two weeks of our return to worship, those Lord's Days should have landed on Ascension Sunday and on Pentecost. It's almost as though the Lord's giving us a sort of restart, uh, getting back to church after, back to worship after a couple months away from the ground up. Uh, our Lord has ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit has descended and is with us. So now what? That's the question. What after that? What's the main priority of the church and of church life? Well, in pursuit of the answer to that question, uh, we're going to continue this morning very near where we left off last time at Acts chapter 2, and uh, turn our attention there to a single verse that encapsulates the, uh, the early ministry, the first priority of the church after Pentecost. Is That's page 911 in your pew Bible, if that helps you. I find it very important that the same Holy Spirit who made himself manifest at Pentecost also moved Dr. Luke's heart and Dr. Luke's hand to write uh, these words, directed him as he penned them to write these first. Acts chapter 2 verse 42, the very first in the record of the life of the Christian church after Pentecost in this epoch. Let's pray. Father, we Thank you for your word, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who has inspired these words to be written to begin with, and so it is no great task for him than to um, illumine our hearts with these same words. For that great work, we humbly ask, because we want our hearts and our lives to be molded and shaped according to your truth, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. What is the first priority of the church? What is the heart of the Christian church? What is, what is our chief calling? How you answer that question determines everything, doesn't it? Everything for us both corporately and because we are nothing if not members of the church of Jesus Christ individually. What is the most important thing? What's at the top? Some might answer that question by saying evangelism. The most important thing we do as a church is to spread the gospel of the good news of eternal life to the unbelieving world. And you know that answer is understandable. We live constantly under the great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. And as much emphasis as this congregation places on missions and evangelism, bringing the gospel, uh, the good news, we know that evangelism must certainly be a high priority. But my question, dear flock, for you is this. What is our chief priority? You ready for the answer? It's this. It's worship. It's worship. Does that surprise you? Does it surprise you that it takes precedence? Worship does even over missions in the church? Well, as Dr. John Piper explains it, now famously in his book entitled Let the Nations Be Glad, missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. And by worship is meant the worship we offer the Lord together as His people on the Lord's day. The Anglicans call it common worship. 
as Isabel and I get to be reminded from time to time when we visit the Anglican service here in town on Sunday afternoons when she's playing the piano for them. We customarily call it corporate worship, but call it what you like. It's the thing that the Holy Spirit put first in the life of the church here in Acts 2. And for good reason. The worship of the Lord on the Lord's Day is the first and most important engine of Christian discipleship. I mean, more than anything else, we are shaped as Christian people. We become what we are as Christian people or not uh, by the work that the Lord does in His sanctuary. What He's doing here right now. There is a subtle but real powerful work going on right now God is bending our minds and shaping our hearts and changing us you know even the unbelieving world bears witness to this power they understand this you remember when uh, the Soviet Union at the beginning of the former Soviet Union over a hundred years ago among the very first, if it wanted, they, as they did, they wanted to capture the hearts and the minds of its people and take control of them. What did they get rid of first? Christian worship. Or at least very early on. This is why worship is so emphasized throughout the entire Bible. Why, as we've seen time and time and time again throughout history, that right worship is so beneficial and Corrupt worship so utterly devastating in its effects. Here in the sanctuary, we learn how to think. We learn how to think about God. We learn how to think about the world. We learn how to think about ourselves. We think about how we think about the universe, how we think of what's beyond. Here we have our aspirations shaped, our hopes are renewed, our longings are deepened here and that's what we've been missing that's what we've been missing for months well no wonder our hearts have been aching like the psalmists aching as a deer pants for water as a deer pants for flowing streams so pants my soul for you oh god my soul thirsts for you for the living god when shall i come and appear before the lord one thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Now here in, in Acts 2.42, I think is another deep reason why we've been so longing for what we're doing, finally getting to do again in this house here this morning. I want to get it to it in just a minute, but first we have to settle a few things about this, this verse. Let me read it again quickly for us. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now the question has been debated, and it is this, whether these are four separate and distinct things distinct from one another, in which case what we have here uh, in this verse is an indication that the earliest Christians after Pentecost would listen to the apostles' teaching, uh, and then perhaps on another occasion they would enjoy fellowship with each other. And, uh, and then at another time they would pray, maybe for the progress of the gospel or for one another. And, uh, and you know, that, that is certainly one possible way to understand this passage, but uh, what most scholars of early Christianity think and what many commentators on the book of Acts have concluded is that what we have here is in fact a short list of elements of the earliest Christian worship. Here is uh, one scholarly description of what we're reading here. There was what we would today call a sermon, as there was in the Jewish worship of the same time. After the apostles' preaching, or before it, we don't know what, that the order is meaningful or, or not here, there was the fellowship or the sharing. It's at least possible that by 
sharing what was meant was the offerings, the gifts that uh, were given by Christians for the common work of the church and of charity uh, to those in need. Uh, we have a pretty good idea that it might certainly be because it's, that gets elaborated in the following chapters in Acts. But it's perhaps more probable that this is a reference, though, to a common meal, to the agape, the love feast that early on before abuses brought it to an end was almost inseparably connected to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And then there's the Lord's Supper itself, here referred to as the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, it's important for us in that scholarly description to notice uh, the the, what grammarians call the what. What is, it? What is the called in, in grammar again? <laughs> it, the article, right? The article, the the before the prayers, it's found here in the, in the original Greek as well. The presence of the article, so that it reads not just prayers, but the prayers, suggests not simply individual prayers offered by individual Christians alone or, to, or, or even together, but the, the common worship service. There's an ongoing pattern here in the book of Acts by which we can certainly discern this. We can jump to the next uh, example of this term being used in Acts. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1, we read about the hour of prayer. The hour, literally, of the prayer. The hour of the prayer. It's a reference to the afternoon service at the temple. A service that, of course, included prayers uh, by the people, but a service that was called prayer in its entirety. And this is underscored when we move, jump uh, with me to Acts chapter 6, where the prayer is used as an abrasive term uh, for Christian public worship. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, we read the apostles saying that an office of deacon ought to be established in the church so that they might continue in their work of the ministry of the word and the prayer. Now, what were the apostles after? Well, it was, it was not so much that they needed time to pray. We don't doubt that they prayed, that the apostles spent plenty of time in prayer, hours in prayer for the advancement of the gospel and for each other and so on. We, we don't doubt that they were men of prayer, but using Scripture to interpret Scripture, we understand Acts 6 here, that here in Acts 6, it is the church's public worship that is in view. The corporate worship, to use our term, our parlance, the common prayer, to use the Anglican term. So what the apostles were saying here, in effect, was this. They had taken over the responsibilities of the ancient priesthood. And these being their primary responsibilities, they must not be distracted from them. The responsibilities of the priests, what were those? Well, you remember Moses laid them out back in Deuteronomy chapter 33, the preaching of the word and the superintendence of the worship of God's people. That is the public worship. So, in the new, new epoch, these responsibilities were now devolved on what we uh, call the Christian ministry the first representatives of which were the apostles themselves. So here we have even Christian worship referred to as the prayer. Now I know we've taken the long way around, so we'll come back and close up the loop here, back to Acts 2.42, and, and now it seems plain that the prayer here in our verse this morning means the worship service of the church. Now we understand historically why the church has called Sunday worship the prayers or the prayer uh, because they learned this, the Christian church learned this from Acts 2 and Acts 3 and Acts 6. We finally get to the point that I promised a few minutes ago and uh, that's this. Worship can be called the prayer or even just prayer because it is. And what is prayer? 
Well, prayer is a conversation. Prayer is a conversation with God. Now, it's a particular kind of conversation with God, to be sure. It's, it's formal, it's heightened, it's public, it is, as we say, corporate, but it is still just that. It's a conversation with God. This is what we're doing in this house right now. It's what we've been missing for over two months. And this is why we've been missing church or worship or whatever word you want to describe it. What we do here in, in the Lord's house on His day, I say it's why we've been missing it so dearly. Here we meet God. Here we meet God in His sanctuary. Here more than anywhere else in our lives, more than anywhere else in the world, we enjoy the promises of God's blessing, of His presence, of finding ourselves truly quorum Deo, before the face of God. You know, if, if it were business meetings that were taking place here on Sunday mornings as we're gathered, none of us would have missed this. Even if these had been evangelistic rallies, you know, trying to win unbelievers primarily, uh, same thing. We wouldn't have missed this but but because these are conversations with god that we're having in his house and worship that's why it's been why we've missed it so much it's been this high conversation between the loved and the beloved that has been missing from our lives these past months several months ago i had the privilege of reading a uh, stack of letters that uh, one of our congregants wrote to his new bride several decades ago from uh, Fort Leonard Wood. And uh, every letter is filled with tenderness and longing, and, and there's lots of them. For every one, it seems, that came from her, three or four missives <laughs> were, were launched right back. You see, love longs to be requited. But maybe, not just as much, maybe even more, love desires to requite. A loved person normally re desires to love in return. Love desires to worship. And the higher, more perfect worship, the better. There's a famous passage in C.S. Lewis's Reflections on the Psalms in which he wrestles with this whole question of, of worship. He was actually struggling to answer the question, why we're required to worship God every week. We're supposed to do this, even as the church has been doing it all this time, all these centuries every week from the very beginning. But why? Why? Is, you know, is, is God vain? Does, his, does he need his, his ego fed? Or, or maybe he's needy? It, does he need us to affirm him? Or maybe worse yet, are we kind of here just bargaining with him, you know, working on the quid pro quo system with him? Or do we do this because God stands on his rights and he knows that it is right to be worshipped and he's going to demand that we acknowledge those rights? No, surely not. I mean, if God were like that, he certainly would not have made the kind of sacrifices he has to save us from our sins. Think about this. Whoever humbled himself like God has humbled himself before us in Jesus Christ Lewis's wrestlings finally led him to this the most obvious fact about praise for our purposes you can switch the word praise or worship for praise whether of God or of anything strangely escaped me Lewis says I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or the giving of honor. 
I had never noticed that all the enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise unless, sometimes even if shyness or the fear of boring others is deliberately brought in to check it. The world rings with praise. Lovers praising their mistresses. Readers their favorite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players praising their favorite game. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, mountains, rare stamps, historical personages, children, flowers, rare beetles, even sometimes politicians or scholars. I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious minds praised most while cranks, misfits, and malcontents praised least. Except where intolerably adverse circumstances interfere, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmists, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. My whole more, Lewis concludes, my whole more general difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly denying to us, as regards the supremely valuable, what we delight to do. What indeed we can't help doing about everything else we value. You see, worship, what we've returned to this house to do, is simply what we yearn to do because our hearts so long to praise the praiseworthy, the supremely valuable one. This is the way we are built. We are worshiping creatures. That's the way the Lord has made us. All the more when we consider how supremely valuable the one whom we praise truly is and how much he has loved us with his amazing love. We, return, we long to return that love, don't we? We long to love back, to requite, and to do that in the chief vehicle that he has offered us to do so which is exactly what we're doing right now. The corporate worship of God, shoulder to shoulder with His people in His sanctuary. And with the tools He's given us. Let's think about the tools a little bit. What tools has He given us to worship? Well, first of all, words. Words. To the point, worship, we learn in Acts, is prayer. We've already established that. And prayer is what? It's conversation. And what we do in this house every week is exactly that. We have a conversation with God. And while it is true that you can talk to God on your own at any time, in any place, look anywhere in your Bible and you will find that private talks with the Lord can simply never substitute for the corporate worship of God. You know, American individualistic uh, flim-flam notwithstanding, uh, you cannot worship God in nearly as high a register uh, standing by yourself in the forest as you can when you are standing like mighty oaks together in the house of the Lord. But to follow up with Lewis, there's something very ordinary about this, isn't there? Something very ordinary about worship. It belongs to our human nature, to the very best of it, to converse with loved ones, with family members, with friends. Now, hasn't this been one of the greatest lessons 
of this whole imposed period of social isolation. And isn't that what, just what we're doing here now? God is our Father, and we are His children. And He's even made us His friends. He calls you His friend. Well, what do friends do? What do families long to do? We long to be together. We long to be together and do what? Talk. Converse. Think, for example, uh, let me illustrate with marriage. You know, any one of you whom I've uh, counseled in preparation for your marriage or in effort to restore happiness to your marriage, remember where we started, right? where we start and where we continue and, and where we end. Right? The whole time, we're constantly coming back to what? Remember? Words. Words, words, words. We go back all the way to the beginning together. We go back to the Garden of Eden to see that it's, it's so true. Before sin entered the world, the conversation of marriage is the conversation of of worship. It is. We get, we get just this glimpse into perfect marriage, into perfect happiness of marriage, finding Adam and Eve there next to each other. Eve has just been created. And Adam opens his eyes on this glorious creature next to him. And what does he say? Well, instinctively, he does what Lewis says all human beings do in regard to the things they value. He opens his mouth and he worships. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Like the man in Proverbs 31, he rises up to bless her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all, he says. Show me a marriage in which a husband and wife love each other with words of praise and of affirmation and encouragement. And yes, where there are words also of grief and self-condemnation where sins have been committed against the other and words of grief must be spoken and then words of forgiveness and restoration are freely extended in return. I say, show me such a marriage and I will show you a happy marriage. Love deepens with words. It's perfected by, by the appreciative and, and the celebratory and worshipful speech. This is what we've longed to do with God. This is what we've been missing in His sanctuary. And He is with us. And this is our conversation with Him in the prayer. And as we meet with Him, our relationship deepens and is purified and is preserved in love and in loyalty and in gratitude. Loving words. Well, there's more. In God's kind providence, we find ourselves for the first time in nearly three months away coming back to this component of worship too, to the table, to the meal. Now, what, what friendship, I ask you, does not sooner or later, in fact, sooner rather than later, involve a meal? On Friday night, we went out to eat at a restaurant for the first time in a long time. And you know, the, the signs were up all over the place about social distancing and all the rest. The basic human nature, you know what happened, right? The basic human nature just took over. Friends were gathering at tables and, and rejoicing around them to see each other again, to, to be together, to talk to each other. And all of that love was cemented, was glued together with guacamole and uh, frijoles and, uh, and chicken uh, quesadillas and uh, tacos al pastor. Uh, did I do that right? Uh, and uh, 
Anyway, they, they weren't at the restaurant just to, just to fill the tank. You know, they weren't there just to nourish their... They could have done that at home, right? Meals, we know this, are often occasions of the most important of conversations. Meals are places where we connect and reconnect. During this time of isolation, it's, uh, we've watched as friends have even carried their own meals uh, to places and, and, and set up six feet away from each other. Why? Because of our instinct. We know instinctively, have a sense of the precious importance for the sake of our relationships to eat together. Well, no surprise then. Here it is. The Lord gives us a meal in this conversation that the church has with them every Lord's day. God is our friend. He has made us his friends. Here he meets with friends at the table. See, what we're doing here in worship is really just a, a super concentration of all of life. It's all coming down into this this hour, this prayer that we have with the Lord. You find it in any, con in, in, in any friendship, conversations, any true relationship. So we, we have it in our worship regularly, just as our fathers and mothers did in the worship that we've just read about. They had a meal. They had the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread. And then, and just quickly, gifts. Gifts. When you love someone, you long to give them something, right? You long to give them gifts. Gifts are an important way, and it's an instinctive way. It's instinctive for us to want to give gifts to our friends and express our love for them and gratitude in, in that sort of concrete form. Again, to C.S. Lewis's point, this is simply how we love people with whom we have a relationship. We do this at birthdays, we do this at anniversaries, we do this at Christmas time, and so on. We give gifts. Sometimes they're material form. Sometimes they're gifts and acts of service, washing the dishes, or folding the clothes, or some loving act. Whatever it is, love gives. This too we've been longing to do. Longing to give to God. It's been pent up in us, and now finally we're getting to release this in action, aren't we? And that, this longing, is active and well in this congregation is evident in this. In this fact, that the biggest financial deficit that this church has ever faced in all of her history, to my recollection, the shortfall that had developed over the past two months, the church treasurers inform me, has completely closed up in just two weeks of worship. In all these ways, worship on the Lord's Day is simply the practice of right relationship. As with others, so with God. The principles are the same, so the practices are the same. It is this conversation, the conversation that, and, and everything that a conversation ought to be honest and intimate and fruitful. Only, uh, in this case, the conversation involves the entire church, the whole bride, the bride of Christ, that is, meeting with her husband, this, too, is how worship is prayer. Simply the right kind of conversation with our Heavenly Father, with Christ, our Savior, with the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. This is what we've been missing. This is what we've been longing for, to speak to Him to hear him speak to us in return, to rejoice together in his goodness, giving him our gifts, sharing a meal, receiving his blessing. 
and basking in his presence. Now, praise God, we know them again, don't we? And we cry with the psalmist, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name lift up my hands. Amen.